بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله We'll continue inshallah ta'ala from the lesson that we started last week reflecting on the ayat of or about Ibad rahman from which surah in the Quran? From Surah Al-Furqan. And we said that last week we wanted to count them. So perhaps some of you went home and did your homework and reflected on the ayat as we requested and you counted them inshallah ta'ala. And we're going to continue to count them today uh, as we continue to reflect on these sifat or these characteristics of, of Ibad al-Rahman. And as we mentioned last week, it's very important that we take out the time to reflect. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ibad al-Rahman, and the servants of al-Rahman, the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he starts to list for us their characteristics and who they are. It's very important if we want to be from those who are close to al-Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we want to be from those who receive the mercy of Allah, that we reflect on these characteristics and we reflect on our actions to see where we are from these characteristics. Last week, how many of these sifat or characteristics did we mention? We explained how many of them last week? Three of them, alhamdulillah. And we'll continue today with the fourth one when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمُ and those who say, Oh, our Lord, avert from us the punishment of Jahannam, the punishment of hell. And making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves us and diverts us from the punishment of hell, which the fire of Jahannam, as it was confirmed in the hadith, is how much hotter than the fire of the dunya? The fire of the dunya, is it hot? It's, it's hot. None of us can handle it. SubhanAllah, may Allah protect us. How much hotter is the, is the fire of the Jahannam? 70 times hotter, as the Prophet wasallam said. And the fire that we see, which is 70 times weaker, but yet it's still a great reminder, the fire of the dunya. When you reflect on the fire, as Allah mentioned, when he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ النَّارَ الَّتِي تُورُونَ And have you seen the fire that you ignite? أَأَنْتُمْ أَنْشَأْتُمْ شَجَرَتَهَا أَمْ نَحْنُ الْمُنْشِئُونَ Is it you who made the tree grow? Or are we the grower? نَحْنُ جَعَلْنَاهَا تَذْكِرَةً وَمَتَاعًا لِلْمُقْوِينَ We have made it a reminder and provision for the travelers. The fire we made it what a reminder. When you see the fire of this dunya, it reminds you of the fire of the hereafter. It reminds you that if your actions are not in accordance with what they should be, that this is where you're going in the hereafter, to this fire, the fire that you see day in and day out. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the verse after that, فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ so exalt the name of your Lord, the most great. Hey, act. Act. Act while you have the opportunity, while you have the chance. And that's why our beloved Prophet wasallam said, النار, Fear the hellfire, even if it's with a half of a date. Do as much action as you can, no matter how small it might be. I was reading a couple of years ago, and I found that one of the Salaf, the early Muslims, he said that Allah created the fire as a rahmah, as a mercy. And I, reflect, I didn't understand it in the beginning. How could it be mercy and the creation of the hellfire? But then when I started to reflect on the meaning of what he was saying, it's a mercy to know. It's there. It's created. And this is going to be the outcome for those who turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are disobedient from Allah. So it's a mercy that you know that if you're not going to be obedient, this is where you're going to go. It helps you stay in line. It helps you do what you're supposed to be doing. It's a reminder to you, as Allah mentioned in the ayat. When you look into the dua of our beloved Prophet wasallam, we find many duas where the Prophet wasallam would seek refuge from Jahannam, seek refuge from the hellfire. From them in the end of the Salat, what do we say? That at the end of the Salat, end of the Shahud, 
we're supposed to seek refuge in four things. What do we say at the end of the Salat? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhab jahannam. The first thing, O oh Allah, seek refuge with you from the punishment of the hellfire. And then from what? وَمِنْ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ From the punishment of the hellfire. وَمِنْ فِتْنَةِ الْمَحْيَةِ وَالْمَمَاتِ And from the trial of life and death. وَمِنْ فِتْنَةِ وَمِنْ شَرِّ فِتْنَةِ الْمَسِيحَ الدَّجَّالِ And from the evil trial of the Messiah Dajjal, the Antichrist. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all of these fitn. And may Allah protect us from the hellfire and from the punishment of the graveyard of Bil From the du'as that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make. A very simple du'a but very powerful in its meaning. When he would say, Allahumma in yas'aluk al-jannah. Oh Allah, I ask you, al-jannah. Wa ma qarrab ilayha min qawlin aw amal. And whatever brings me nearer to jannah from a quote, from a statement, or from an action. And then he would say, wa'udhu bika min al-nawr. And I seek refuge with you from the hellfire. Wa ma qarrab ilayha min qawlin aw amal. And whatever actions will bring me closer to the hellfire. SubhanAllah. Because what's important is seeking refuge from the hellfire, asking Allah the Jannah, but also the actions that are going to help us get to Jannah and to help us refrain and stay away from the actions that will lead us to the hellfire. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the end of the verse described for us Jahannam with one of the many descriptions that came in the Quran. Inna adabaha kana gharama. That the punishment is a permanent punishment, not something that will ever end. The one who enters there will be tortured eternally. Just as the one who enters into Jannah, he will be in Naim, in pleasure eternally. Innaha sa'ad mustaqarran wa muqama, indeed is an evil settlement and residence. This is Jahannam. The fourth characteristic that they seek refuge from Adab Jahannam. The fifth characteristic, walladina idha anfaqu. Those who spent. How do they spend their money? Pay attention to the characteristics of how they spend their money. Lam yusrifu. That they are not, they do not spend it excessively. Walam yakturu. And they're not stingy with it. Wakana bayna dalika qawama. And they are between, moderate, between the two. They're not stingy holding back against themselves and their family. And they're not excessively spending and wasting the money at the same time. Ibadur Rahman, they're moderate in how they spend the money. The best way of spending our money, <coughs> as it came in the hadith which is narrated in Sahih Muslim, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that, Abdal dinar yunfiquhu rajil. The most excellent type of dinar that the person will spend is the one that he spends upon his family. That's the best money you can spend, money spent on your family. And after that, he said, the one that he spends on his animal and the path of Allah. And the third is the one spent on his companions in the path of Allah. Al-Imam al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that there's no excessive spending when it comes to spending in the path of Allah. That there's no wasting. You can spend as much as you want, meaning when it comes to spending in the path of Allah. But obviously, this is if we spend first of all on what on our family as we learn from the hadith if we spend on our family and we're taking care of our family then the rest can be spent feasibility <clears throat> the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in sahih bukhari it's confirmed that he would take the money that he received from khaybar and he would put it aside for his family for all of their needs for the entire year and what was left over he would spend it all in the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so making sure you take care of your family first is what Islam teaches us. After that, we spend for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us of how we spend our money, that we're moderate in how we spend it. And it's very important in the societies that we live in today, especially here, where there's a lot of excessive spending, a lot of wasting. Unfortunately, when you go back to where many of us come from in the West, you'll see that the teachings of Islam are more implemented when it comes to how people spend. They spend moderately. And they're not, not, they're not Muslims, but they spend moderately and they don't waste their money. Huh? They don't buy things that they don't need. They don't throw things out and waste things. 
They take away, they take away from the restaurant. They're not shy or throw it away. They don't cook a bunch of food that gets thrown out in the end. And this is how we need to be as Muslims. This is what Islam is teaching us. Not to be wasteful. Not to waste our money. We're going to be asked about how we spend our money Yom Al-Qiyamah. How much of the food and the things that we waste that could be benefiting our brothers who are less needy than us? Or brothers who are in need from around the world? So we spend as Muslims. We don't hold back. Because some say, I'm a, I, like to live, I like to live nice, I like to live comfortable. Alhamdulillah, that's no problem. Even the teachings of Islam, when the person wants to have nice clothes, and wants to have, we mentioned the hadith last week, he wants to have nice shoes and nice clothes. Is it permissible? Permissible. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? In Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. That indeed Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned about having a nice ride and a nice house. These are from the things that bring happiness. So there's nothing wrong as long as it doesn't distract us and as long as we're not wasteful and flamboyant in how we spend the money. But to live comfortably in moderation, this is okay. This is what Islam calls us to do. And what we have left over, we spend for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next characteristic, many of the scholars, when you read them talking about Ibad rahman they say that the sixth characteristic, and they mention this ayah, which actually has three characteristics in it. So pay attention to that. When it comes to the counting, they say there's six characteristic, and they mention the three sins that are mentioned in the ayah that they stay away from. So do you count it as one, or do you count it as three? I personally see it being three different things. Even though many times you'll find those who explain it from the scholars, they mention this as, as the, the sixth point. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. The first thing, that they, they do not invoke another deity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They stay away from shirk. The Prophet alayhi salatu was was asked about أَيُّ ذَمْ أَعْظَمْ What is the greatest sin? And he said alayhi salatu was salam أَن تَجْعَلِ اللَّهِ نِدًّا وَهُوَ خَلَقًا to make equals to Allah, and He is the one who created you. To make equals to Allah, and He is the one who created you. The Prophet ﷺ reminds us of the fitrah inside. That our Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the only one who has the right to be worshipped without joining any partners. What is the outcome of shirk and those who fall into shirk? In Allah, la yaghfir ayushrika bi. That Allah does not forgive to join partners with Him. And He forgives other than that to whom He pleases. Any sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive, except for the shirk. If you make tawbah from it, you repent from alhamdulillah, it will be forgiven. But if you die upon shirk, you will not be forgiven. This is the one sin that Allah won't forgive. He's the one who created you. He's the one who gave to you. He's the one who nourished you. He's the one who provided for you. And then you join partners and make equals to Allah in your worship. That's why the sin won't be forgiven. How can we stay away from shirk? The greatest sin, the only sin that won't be forgiven. What can we do to stay away from it? It starts with knowledge. That's why Allah told us in the Quran, "Fa'lam annahu la ilaha illallah." Then know, la ilaha illallah. Understand its meanings properly. Understand tawheed. What is the meaning of la ilaha illallah? So many Muslims today. You ask them, what does la ilaha illallah mean? And they have no clue. He says the kalima. He believes in it. Or what, at least what he thinks he understands, he believes in it. You'll say, that they'll come and they'll say, there's no raziq, no provider, no creator, except for Allah. That's only one part of la ilaha illallah. The mushrikeen of Quraysh, they believe the same thing that you believe, brother. That was their belief as well. When they say, what does la ilaha illallah mean? The true meaning of la ilaha illallah, la ma'buda bi haqqan illallah. That there's no deity, no God worthy of worship, except for Allah. Allah is the only one who has the right to be worshipped. So we need to understand truly what la ilaha illallah means, and then we need to understand what is shirk. I said in a lecture some time back, that many, all of the Muslims almost, almost all of the Muslims, maybe 99% of the Muslims have shirk in their households. Not me. I'm wahid. I'm, I'm on tawheed. SubhanAllah, shirk enters our household so easily these days we don't even know it. The cartoons that our kids are watching at home, 
full of shirk and full of kufr. Walt Disney, oh, it's just cartoons. The skin is something small. Full of shirk and full of kufr. And it's full of other evil things as well, subhanAllah. Subliminal message is taking away the innocence of your children and how they think. But even worse than that, it has shirk and kufr in it. All built upon sihr and magic and all this stuff. And it's, it's innocent, it's cartoons, and we're letting our kids watch it. So what do we do? What is the alternative? We don't have good Islamic cartoons, unfortunately. There are a few of them, but not good. So at least you sit with your children to know what they're watching. And don't just let them open the TV and watch anything. That could be harming them and could be taking them out of the fold of Islam if they believe in it. Be careful. And that's just one example of how shirk spreads. But how do I know? I have knowledge right away. When I have knowledge, I see that this is kufr, this is shirk. I know it. I can't accept it as a Muslim. So it starts with knowledge and being able to protect yourself and protect your family so you have strong tawheed and you don't fall into shirk. The next characteristic, وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ And they do not kill the soul which Allah has forbidden to be killed except by right. How many types of killing are mentioned here in the verse? I'll reflect, ya khuan. How many types of killing? And they do not kill the soul which Allah has forbidden to be killed except by right, that which is right. First of all, what does it mean by that which is right? What type of killing can be right? Is, any, is there any type of killing that's good? What type of killing? Like what? Execution. The qisas. If someone is a killer and he gets killed, that's ayn al-adl. That's, that's, that's true justice. If someone is a killer, then he gets killed. That's, 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 that's being killed with what something is right. If you're defending yourself, you're defending the, the, the Muslim land that you live in, it's attacked and you have to defend. That's, a, that's, that's something that's permissible. If someone comes into your home and wants to kill you, and your, and your or your family, and wants to steal from you, and he's coming at you, coming at your children, is it permissible or not permissible? They say shoot him in the leg first, huh? But inshallah, and he, maybe hit an artery or something, and he goes out, Allah alam. But in this case, it's permissible. You're defending yourself, defending your home. So that's, that, that, these are, are, are examples of things that are right on the battlefield, if it's something that's qisas, these type of things, they're, they're, they're righteous and a, and, a, and, a, and a kill that's acceptable in Islam. But uh, we, and we understand from the ayah, even though it mentions this one, we understand that there's another one. Even though it's not mentioned directly in the verse, only one is mentioned, but we understand right away that there's a type of killing which is what? Which is unjust. Which is what? Killing an innocent individual. Uh, killing someone who's a dhimmi. The ones who are in the Muslim countries from other religions who have the right to be there. And they're given the right to be there. And you have also the mu'ahad. The one who has, a, 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 has been given assurance. Or the musta'min who's been given the assurance to come in. Uh, the, or the mu'ahad is the one who has a, a treaty between them and the Muslims. The Mu'ahad, the one who has a treaty between themselves and the Muslims, he's safe, not allowed to be harmed. The Musta'man, the one who has been given permission to enter into a Muslim country. Some people will come and say, well, they shouldn't be here in a Muslim country. That doesn't give you right to harm them. And that's not your, your, it's not upon you. Yawm al Qiyam, Allah is not going to ask you about that. Who has the people in charge about that, but not you. So since they're in a country that you're in, that's a Muslim country, and they've been given, like we say now, a visa to enter. That means he's a musta'min. He's been given permission to enter from the government. That means he's safe when he enters into the Muslim country. And he's not allowed to be harmed. All of these things are, unharm, are, are, are haram for a Muslim to harm any of them. SubhanAllah, when you look in the days that we live in, that the killing has become such, so widespread, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned this, that at the end of time, it becomes so widespread that the killer won't know why he's killing and the one who's killed won't know why he was killed. And if you look at another hadith which was narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that the last hour will not come until certain things happen. From them, that religious knowledge will be taken away. The ilm will go away. Secondly, earthquakes will become more frequent. Time will pass quickly, afflictions will appear, murders will increase, and money will overflow amongst you. Have those signs happened, Ya Akhwan? 
All of them have happened, subhanAllah. And when you hear a hadith like this, this makes you feel that the hour has come close. It could be at any time. Therefore, what do I need to do as a Muslim? Make sure that I'm prepared. Make sure that I'm prepared. Because all of these things are widespread now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and help the Muslims, Ya Rabbil Alameen. The next characteristic, which if we're counting this ayah as three, which one is it? Which number is it? Eight. Number eight, alhamdulillah. Some of the brothers are writing down, mashallah. Most what happens, most brothers come to the, the halaqat and they say, no, no, I don't need to write down, I'll memorize. But what you're going to do, if you don't write down, you forget. And that's why the scholar said, the brother said, I got the video camera. You, most people are not going to go back. But if you have like a little, little notepad or like the brother has a little notepad on his phone, it's very easy to go back to. You're putting bullet points. It's much easier than even going on YouTube and after you, you have to go five minutes forward then three minutes back and then ten minutes ahead to get all the numbers. You write it down and when you write something down, it makes it stick into the mind. It's even better than reading, better than hearing. When you write something down, it sticks. So alhamdulillah, those who write it down, they'll benefit more. And as the scholar said, qayyudu al-ilm bil-kitab. Write down your knowledge. Write down your knowledge by, any, uh, by writing it down. That's how you're going to benefit from the knowledge, inshallah ta'ala. And it's not something that we should shy away from. Where say, even if it's on the phone, if people like to go you know, the new school, or like the brother going old school. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was walking, and he used to walk around with the ink pen. You know, they used to dip it into the, 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 the feathered pencil or whatever it was, or the pencil, the stick, into the what? And to the, uh, and to the ink stand, and they would write. So he'd walk around with this, and he said, Imam Ahmed, the great scholar of Islam. And some of the people thought it was strange. They said, Imam Ahmed, المحبرة, the mihbara, the ink stand, he has it with him. And he said, with, with pride, he said, المحبرة المقبرة, that I have the ink stand with me, the mihbara, until I go to the maqbara, to the graveyard. I'm always going to be writing, I'm always a student. There's no shame in that. Alhamdulillah, that's how we benefit from the knowledge. So it's, it's better, inshallah, hopefully next week, brothers will come, inshallah ta'ala, with, uh, and it's better, actually physically writing is better than the, 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 than the, than the telephone. And what happens on the telephone, as you're writing, other things pop up, notifications pop up, and then you become distracted. Unless you put it on a flight mode, inshallah ta'ala, and then you write with it. The eighth characteristic, wala yaznun, that they do not fornicate. They do not fall into unlawful sexual intercourse. When you look at the verse in Surah Al-Isra, Allah said, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina," And do not approach the zina, the unlawful intercourse. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا Don't even come near it. Stay far away from it. Anything that brings you closer to it, you put a barrier between yourself and that. And that's why Islam came not just to forbid us from this, but to forbid us from the actions that will lead us to this. What's an example? Free mixing. What else? Lowering the gaze. What did Allah tell us in Surah An-Nur? Tell the believers to do what? يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ That they lower their gaze. What does Allah say immediately after that? After the command to lower the gaze? وَيَحْفَظُ فُرُوجَهُمْ And that they guard their private parts. And the verse which comes after that, for the sisters, what did Allah say? To tell the mu'minat, يَغْضُدْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ That they lower their gaze. وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ That they lower their gaze and they protect their private parts. Why did Allah mention the private parts right after lowering the gaze? Because this is where it all starts. By looking at that which is haram. By free mixing as our brother said. When Islam forbids free mixing, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Beware of going into the houses or the places where the women are, mixing with them. Because even if there's no attraction, there's nothing, if you mix, you're going to see something that's going to entice you sooner or later. One of the Ansar who was sitting and he heard this hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, he said, What about Alhamu? Alhamu meaning, the brother of the husband, meaning the, the brother-in-law of the, of the wife. You're married to a sister and your brother, and this is the, the common custom in many countries around the world today. 
Ah, this is my brother. It's my brother. I can trust my brother. Shaitan is stronger than your brother. Shaitan is stronger than your wife. Oh, my wife is pious. She might be, mashallah alayha. But shaitan is stronger. The Prophet, what did he say? He said that a man and a woman are not alone together except for who is the third? A shaitan thalithuhuma. The shaitan is the third one. When he was asked about the hamu, about the brother of the husband, he said, al hamu al maut. That the brother of the husband is like death because he brings destruction to the household when there's free mixing between them. If you truly love your brother, you don't mix with his wife because it brings evil and it brings calamities. It destroys household. Shaitan's there. Shaitan is there. Subhanallah. May Allah protect us. There's different types of zina, different types of fornicating. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there, it's been written upon the children of Adam a portion of zina that they will indulge in. There's no escape from it. And he said that the zina of the ayn, the fornicating of the ayn, of the eye, it's in the lustful look. And that of the ear is in the listening. And of the tongue is in the speech. And the hand is in the touching. And the zina of the feet is walking, a walking to the place where he intends to commit zina. He said, the heart yearns and desires for it. Pay attention, Ikhwan. And this is the beauty of Islam. Islam doesn't come and just forbid you. It talks about the reality. The reality is that we yearn for it. The heart yearns for that. When you see a beautiful woman, what does your heart want to do? It doesn't matter how pious you are. Unless you're a bit funny, that's different. Huh? But any normal man, when he sees a beautiful woman, he wants to look. Why don't we look? Because we have a command from Allah to lower our gaze. And if we go back to the verse in Surah An-Nisa, ذَلِكَ azka, ذَلِكَ azka lahum, That that is more purifying for them. We are purifying our heart when we look away. If we look back, we're going to commit a sin. And it's going to harm us. And it can call us to fall into that which is greater sin. If we continue to look. That's why we have to protect our iman and protect our private parts. Protect our deen, our faith. By lowering our gates. And they do not commit unlawful intercourse. The tenth characteristic or ninth characteristic is their tawbah, their repentance of Ibad al-Rahman. And it's interesting how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned these sins, which are some of the gravest sins, and then makes an exception. Because as we mentioned at the end, he mentions the punishment of these people who fall into these sins. And then he mentions an exception to those who will be punished. Illa mantab. Except for those who make tawbah. Illa mantaba wa amana wa amila amalan saliha. Except for those who repent and they believe and they do good deeds. If we want our tawbah to be accepted, how many conditions must be met? The main conditions, what are they? Three of them. First of all, that we leave the sin. Secondly, that we have the intention to never go back to that sin. And the third is that we regret the sins that we committed in the past. If we, these conditions are fulfilled, our tawbah will be accepted. And if we add to that tawbah, pure iman, Pure Iman, which what shows up in the actions and has good deeds, these three conditions, the Tawbah and the Iman and the good deeds. What happens to all of our bad deeds? That Allah will turn their bad deeds into good deeds. Allah Akbar. Imagine all of our bad deeds. If we truly repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfill the conditions of Tawbah, and we have true iman, which shows up in our actions and our good deeds, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take all of those bad deeds and turn them into good deeds. The next characteristic, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ And here, some of the scholars count this as one, and some of it counted as two, because there's two things mentioned in this ayah. And there's a reason why they count it as one, and, and perhaps we'll mention, inshallah, that at the end. So you can count this as one, or you can count it as two different characteristics. 
The first is that وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشَادُونَ الزُّورِ And those who do not testify to falsehood. Imam al-Sa'adi, when he talked about the zur that they do not testify to, he said that's haram statements and actions. He said they stay away from all of the gatherings that have haram statements or actions. Pay attention, everyone. They stay away from all of the gatherings. And many of us will find this, whether it be our family members or friends or colleagues, when things are being haram that are said or done. If you want to be from Ibadah Rahman, you stay away from these gatherings. Whether you'll find sometimes in these gatherings, they're making fun of things of the religion. This is even worse. This is the worst this day if they listen to this. Or where there's kufr being committed, which is even worse than that. Both of them are kufr in the end. Huh? Types of kufr or making fun of the religion is kufr in itself, isn't it? So these type of things when they're being done, the Muslim must get up and go away from this. If there's any ill speech, dirty talk, uh, making fun of others, making riba, making amima, all of these things, the true believer doesn't sit in such a gathering. He doesn't allow it. If I hear they're making fun of, uh, of other people, talking about making riba and namima of other people, say, I, I can't sit in a sitting like this. And I'm proud because I want to be from Ibadur Rahman. I want to be a true Muslim. I stand up. I'm not shy. I stand up and say, look, if you guys are going to continue to talk about this stuff, I have to go because I'm a Muslim. They must say, so are we. <laughs> but this is what we're ordered to do. We have to get up and we have to walk away. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the shahada of zur, what is shahada of zur? The zur. They do not testify the zur. It came in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said, should I not inform you of the greatest of sins? And they said, of course, Ya Rasulullah. The first sin, which one is it? We know, Ya Khan, what is the greatest sin? Al-Ishraqu Billah. To join partners with Allah, and to worship other than Allah. The second of the greatest sins, to be undutiful to your parents. Allahu Akbar. The rights of the parents. To be undutiful to the parents. Uquq al-Walidain. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was leaning back as he was talking to his, his companions. And then he sat up. He sat up and he said, Allah wa qawlu zur And he said, and I warn you against giving a false witness to testify falsely. And then he kept repeating, alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah wa qawlu zur Allah wa qawlu zur And I warn you of giving a false testimony. And the Sahaba who were there, they said, he kept saying it so much that we wished he would stop. We wished he would stop. Why? Because the fact that the Prophet وسلم, keeps repeating it, that means it's a scary sin to fall into. And it's something that we could be inclined to, especially when it comes to our relatives, to our friends, that we stand up and we might testify for them. We got into an accident. Whose fault was it? Your close friend who was talking on his phone and breaking the law. He said, look, I'm going to, say, I'm going to blame it on him and say he did this. He said, when the, when the police officer comes, you testify as well. It'll be two against one, and he'll have to pay for me. It won't be my insurance. Huh? So what do you do as a Muslim? Because Allah is going to ask me about that Yom Qiyamah. It's one of the major sins the Prophet warned about. So when the police officer comes, what do you say? Say, it was the fault of my friend who was talking on his phone. He was, he was that wrong. Hmm? He was the one who was that wrong. At work, your colleague comes and say, look, say it was so-and-so who messed up. Don't say it was me because the boss didn't say, no. If I'm asked, I'm going to tell the truth. They come to me. This is a major sin. I'm not going to fall into it. I'm not going to be held accountable for that Yom Al-Qiyamah. The next characteristic, or perhaps from the same characteristic, if you want to count it as one or two, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا And when they pass by ill speech, they pass by with dignity. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they pass by. What do you understand from this? They pass by it. Meaning, were they there in the gathering? They were in the gathering, but they passed by by coincidence. You're in a location and you pass by such ill speech. You pass by such zur, people saying ill things or doing ill acts, unacceptable acts. You see it, you hear it. How do you pass by? You pass by with dignity. You don't pay attention to it. 
Recently, I took my kids out to play at a park. I think it was one of these international uh, things where they have different nationalities coming. It was a certain nationality, and they were doing their traditional stuff of singing and dancing with music and stuff like this, and men with, with even with beards jumping around singing uh, and stuff like this, subhanAllah. I happened to walk by. The exit was there. I had to walk by. What can I do? So this now I have to walk by what? With kirama. With kirama. I have to walk by with, with dignity. Lower my gaze. Try not to listen to what's being said so it doesn't stick into my mind and walk by. You walk by an area where people are dancing, singing, drinking. You'll see it. I was in a Muslim country recently. It was late at night. I was walking with my family. We walked by an area where people had their beers and they're out drinking and the music was very loud. We have to walk by, lower our gaze, not look, seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, walk by with dignity. This is the way of the believer. The origin is that the Muslim does not attend any type of gathering like this, where anything haram is being said or done. This is the origin, the origin, the asal. But if he happens to be a place in a place where haram is being said or done, what does he do? Speaks up, makes inkar, if he can stop it, and if he can't, then what does he do? He leaves. If you can speak up, if you can stop it, maybe if you're someone who's the head of the family, you can, you can physically stop it. If someone comes into your house and is listening to music from, from, from your children or something like that, and you don't allow music in your household, you can go turn it off, can't you? That's your right. And when something is done that is haram, I walked into a brother's house a couple of months ago, practicing family. I was smelling, I said, smoke. I was like, what, what is it? bro, what is this, man? It's like, it really stinks, you know? I mean, I know they don't smoke. I mean, I, I wouldn't And he said, there's a sister. Astaghfirullah. There's a sister who visits my wife who smokes. My wife is shy to say anything to her. I said, Bismillah rahman I mean, This is your house. This is your mamlaka. This is your kingdom. You guys are in charge here. This is your house. If someone enters your house, they follow your rules. You say smoking is haram, smoking is not allowed. You're not going to smoke in my house. Can I get an ashtray? You can get out if you want to smoke. <laughs> not in my house. No way. And it, it, it stinks, especially and a non-smoker knows how bad it stinks. And then it, even children around, things like this. You can't allow something like this to happen in your house. So you speak out against it. SubhanAllah mentioned in, the, in Surah An-Nisa, وَقَدْ نَزَّلْ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الْكِتَابِ أن إذا سمعتم آيات الله يكفر بها ويستهزئ بها فلا تقعدوا معهم حتى يخوضوا في حديث غير إنكم إذا مثلهم سبحان الله. In this verse, Allah said, and it has already come down to you in the book that when you hear the verses of Allah being denied or being ridiculed, and this is the people who are falling into what making fun of the religion, especially. But even when haram acts are being done, we can reflect on this ayah and the meanings as well. When haram is being done, because if someone knows something is haram and they're doing it, then you're gonna, it can fall under this category as well. What did Allah say? فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعْهُمْ Do not sit with them. حَتَّى يَخُودُونَ فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِ Until they enter into another conversation. And then he said, then you indeed will, you will be just like them. If you sit and listen to it as they're doing haram or saying something that's haram against the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to fall into the same thing. So when people are, are falling into haram, you get up and you walk out. Marru kirama, this is the same thing. They get up and they walk out with dignity. I'm, I'm proud of who I am as a Muslim. Many times I'm in an area, I'm in some of they, they want to smoke. It's very rare, but you, every now you have those, some people, may Allah guide them, even they see practicing brothers sometimes, and they say, it's my majlis, I light up. I say, Masalama. And you know not going to respect me as your guest? I'm, I'm going to leave. I mean, I mean, I might come back later, but I'm not going to sit there, you, you blow smoke around. I'm not going to go into a place where they're smoking shisha in the majlis. That's not where I'm going to sit, you know. So this is what the Muslim must do in this type of thing, that he leaves. And as some of the scholars mentioned, the fact that he said that they go by with dignity. This is why some of them counted it as one. Because obviously these ill acts are being said or done there, just like the ones who don't testify for the zur, because zur, it's, 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 it's vast to all of that, which is haram, it falls under it. So if you go past that, and they, that's why they counted it as one. So it could be two characteristics, it could be one. 
and nonetheless, and he, there's, there's two lessons that we gain from it in Shalotana. The next characteristic, and we have two more to go. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُوا عَلَيْهَا سُمَّنْ وَعُمْيَانًا And those, when they're reminded of the verses of their Lord, that do not fall upon the deaf and the blind. Meaning that what? When somebody comes and reminds you, what do you say? Jazakallah khairan. What did Umar radiallahu an used to say? He would say, Rahimallah imriyan ahda ilayya uyubi. May Allah have mercy upon the person who gives me as a gift my faults. A gift. Because as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, al-mu'min miratu akhihi. That the believer is the mirror of his brother. The reflection of his brother. Meaning that we advise one another. It doesn't matter who you are, what status you are. If I'm a teacher and I make a mistake and someone comes and tells me, I say, Jazakallah khair. I say, you made a mistake in something you said in the lecture. I say, Jazakallah khair, I'll fix it. I'm happy to hear that. I won't make the same mistake again. But if he didn't tell me, he was shy to tell me, what would happen? I would give the lecture again and make the same mistake. And I would give it maybe a, a, a fifth time and a sixth time. And all around the world, I'm making the same mistake because my brother didn't correct me. I would say, who are you to correct me? I'm the, I'm the sheikh, I'm the teacher. I said, Jazakallah khair. If it comes to you, you benefit from it. You take it as something constructive, something beneficial for you. You accept the advice. فَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِينَ Allah tells us, remind because the reminder benefits the believer. You're the one benefiting when you're reminded. We come to these lectures, even though there was heavy traffic, it was difficult to get here for some of us. But we made the effort wise to be reminded. We came here for the reminder. We come to Jum'ah tomorrow for what? To be reminded. Not just to fulfill an obligation, but to benefit from the reminder. So if someone comes to you with something beneficial, you accept it and you take it. The last characteristic mentioned, which is either 12 or 13, depending on how we counted the other one. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ Once again, from their du'a. We mentioned the dua. The first one was what? That Allah would protect them and, and avert them from what? The punishment of Jahannam. Here in this dua, they're saying, Rabbana hablana. Ya khuan, it's very important that the duas from the Quran, we focus on making them in the dua that we make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We understand its meanings, and then we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these duas. We look in Surah Ali Imran, Rabbana. لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا. What an amazing dua. Oh, our Lord, don't make our hearts go astray after you have guided us. We learn this dua from the Quran. We learn its meanings and we implement it in our dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Here, from this dua, ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة how many things did we make dua for in this verse? Pay attention. O oh, our Lord, grant us from among our wives and our offspring comfort to our eyes and make us an example for the righteous. How many things? Three things. We made dua for our, our wives, for our children, and we made dua that Allah would make us an example for the righteous. When it comes to making dua for our family by being thankful to our wives. It starts with that. SubhanAllah, I remember one family where the wife and the children, they'd always say to the father, Jazakallah khairan. And when the wife would do something, the husband would say, Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you. Barakallah fiki. What did she do? She did something with her wajib. It's something that's the agreement they have she takes care of the ministry of what? Interior. And he takes care of the ministry of? Exterior. Huh? Outside. He brings home the food. He's coming home from the grocery store. He has to do this. It's compulsory. But when his wife says, Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you for all the effort you do for the family. Yes, salam. She makes dua for him. She comes and she puts the food in front of him. This is the agreement they have that she's going to do this. And he says, Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you. In the morning, she wakes up to iron his clothes so he can go to work looking good, looking proper. 
And he said, Zechelo Khaira, Habibti. May Allah bless you. Has a huge impact there, Khwan. To constantly make dua for them. That's in front of them, but even more so to make dua for them when they don't know. In your sujood. To make dua for all they do for us. To make dua for all the khair. Because the khair for your spouse is the khair for your family. The good for them is the good for the entire family. And then making dua for the children. All throughout the Quran, Allah gives us examples of the salihin making dua for their children. Of the prophets making dua for their children. Unfortunately, nowadays, many people make dua against their children when they mess up. May Allah not give you tawfiq. May Allah not help you because you messed up and you did this. Beware of that. Because the dua of the parents, as it came in the sunnah, is what? Mustajab. It's accepted. One of the duas that will be accepted from Allah. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu he forbid us from making dua against our children. Perhaps the problems that their children are facing is because the dua they made upon them. Always make dua for them. No matter how bad it might be. Allah yadik. So what you did wasn't good. May Allah guide you. May Allah help you. May Allah help me with you. <laughs> okay? But never make dua against them. No matter what. Always make dua for them. And you see this example throughout the Quran of making dua for their children. Even if your children are pious, ya akhwan, brothers and sisters. See, my children, alhamdulillah, they're good. They pray five times a day. They stay away from haram. They uh, get A's at school. Alhamdulillah, they're doing good. Make dua that Allah will increase them. Make dua that Allah will keep them firm. Make dua to Allah that when they're tested, because they're going to be tested like everyone, make, make dua that, that they're going to stay firm. Because now maybe at home, they're not facing challenges. When they face challenges in the future, they need the dua. SubhanAllah, one man, in a beautiful story, he said, I went into my mother's room to show you the status of the mother. I heard my mother making dua for us, and she was in her sleep. She's sleeping and making dua for her children. Because it's in her heart, it's in her mind. So she's making this dua even as she's sleeping, subhanAllah. And this is the true parent constantly making dua for the success of their children. At the end of the verse, وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama, And to make us an example for the righteous. What does this mean? We want to be from the righteous first of all, but also an example for others to follow righteousness as well. Not to show off, but in order to inspire and to remind others in order to get the reward as well. One of my neighbors, I don't know who he is, but about five minutes after the adhan every day, I hear the door of him going to Salat al-Fajr. He's going five minutes after the adhan every day. So he encourages me, because this is the time usually I film, because it's quiet at this time. So before, before that, I do a little filming, the adhan will be called, I stop a bit, and then I'll continue. And I try to get to Fajr right before the iqama. Huh? This is the time my kids are not jumping around and things like that. As you guys have seen, my kids, mashallah, rather active, especially when the two of them are together. So there's no filming in daytime for me, huh? So if I want to film something, I film it this time. But I hear the brother, the door every day at that time. It's more important now. This is the time for the salat. If you want to film, get a, tomorrow wake up a bit earlier and do your filming then. And then, uh, but now it's time to go to the masjid. It's time to get up and make your wudu and go if you don't already have, have wudu, subhanAllah. And when, when I give sadaqah, when I help someone out, I want to be an example to remind other people of this righteousness so they'll follow in the path as well. Because this is what we want to be as Muslims. We want to be those who are keys to open up the doors for khair for everyone else. We want to be reminders for everyone else when they see us doing the good that they follow in our footsteps. So these are the characteristics of Ibad rahman Some of them say 10, some say 12, some say 13, depending how you count. Uh, the ayat, and what came in the ayat. Uh, I, I put down 13 myself. Uh, these are the characteristics of Ibad rahman that we need to reflect on and see where we are from them and implement them in our lives. The du'as that we memorize them and start to make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these du'as. As we end, and I went a bit longer today than I usually do because I didn't want to talk about the same topic next week, so forgive me for that because I try to not go more than 30 minutes, but I think I've gone way over uh, today. Allah mentions then after that the reward of Ibad al-Rahman. أُولَٰئِكَ يُجَزُونَ الْغُرْفَةَ بِمَا صَبَرُوا وَيُلَقَّوْنَ فِيهَا تَحِيَّةً وَالسَّلَامًا خَالِدِنَ فِيهَا حَسَنَةً مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا 
that these are the ones who received the ghurfa, the chamber, for what they patiently endured in this dunya. And they will be received when they enter into the Jannah by greetings and words of peace to eternally be there, to, abo to, to abide eternally within the Jannah. What a good settlement and a resident, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. This is the reward of Ibad al-Rahman, bima sabaru. What do, we, what do we gain from this? When Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ يُجْزَوْنَ الْغُرْفَةَ that Yudzona, they will be rewarded. And he mentions what they will be rewarded, the war for the high chambers the high, in, in the Jannah, bima sabaru, with what they patiently endured. If you want to achieve any of these characteristics, what is the first key? Have sabr. If we want to be from those, وَإِذَا خَاطَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا السَّلَامَ As we talked about last week. When the ignorance come to you, and they speak to you words of ignorance, automatically you want to what? We want to reply back. But we have to have sabr in order not to reply back. If we want to do all of these good deeds, constantly repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, good, do good deeds. Stay away from these haram acts. We need to have sabr. The help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sabr if we're going to be successful. Something interesting I told you I would mention to you last week. When you reflect on these ayat, and this is something that I was reflecting on myself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after you mentioned the three grave sins that they stay away from, what were they? The three sins? The shirk? They came, they came in, 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 in verse 68. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the ones who don't make dua to Allah and don't kill the innocent people and they what, stay away from fornicating. Three things were mentioned. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the punishment that those individuals will get. Also three things mentioned after that. Whoever does these sins, they will meet a punishment. يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ then the punishment, number two, that the punishment it will be multiplied for them on the day of resurrection. And he will be eternally humiliated in the fire. Those three grave sins and three punishments. The exception to the rule was made. Allah also mentioned here what? Three things that if they do it, that they will all be what? All of the bad deeds will be turned into good deeds. What was it? The Tawbah, the repentance, the Iman. Now these are the conditions of Tawbah. We're talking about mention the Ayah. The Iman and good deeds. If you have these three, then no matter what the sins were, they'd be turned in shallow ta'ala into, into good deeds. And then at the end, Allah mentions the three things that the people they will receive in the hereafter. From the in the in the Jannah force, they will get the uh, al ghurfa the high chambers of the Jannah, and that they will uh, be greeted by Tahiyatan was salama by greetings of words and peace, and they will be eternally in the Jannah. So it's interesting, so if you mention, if you look at it, how it comes, as you reflect through the Quran, you find things like this, which as you read it, you say, okay, that was three major sins, and then three punishments, and then the exception to the rule, if you do three things, all of those bad deeds will get turned into, into, into good deeds, and then at the end, the three things that we get in the Jannah. Allah Akbar. There's more than that, obviously. There's more punishments than the three. There's more you get in the Jannah than, 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 the, than those three things. But nonetheless, it's interesting just to kind of see how it comes in the Quran like that. I found it interesting myself. And Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabi Muhammad. Wallahu alam. And if there was anything good, inshallah, as it was said, inshallah, in these reminders, then it was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any mistakes, it was from myself and from a shaytan. And if there's any questions, inshallah, we'll we have a bit of, of Q&A. We went a bit over, like I said, I apologize for that, but we wanted to, um, to finish it today, inshallah.